Varsha, shall we start? It's Ma'am, just make me fast. Can you co-host yeah. me? It is showing that you have disabled participant screen sharing. Okay, great. So I welcome everyone and good evening to all. So here we are in the series of monthly webinar by the study by the Society for Study of Pain, Pune. So I, Dr. Varsha Kurade, on behalf of Pune Pain Society, welcome you all for this webinar with the theme of lower limb nerve entrapment. Now I would like to call upon our president, Dr. Varshali Kenya, to have a few words. Thank you, Varsha. Good evening, everyone. So this is again one more series of webinar conducted by Society for Study of Pain Pune. And on that background, I warmly welcome you all for the proceedings. This is in succession of our last webinar a month ago, where we had done upper limb entrapments. And now we will cover the lower limb uh, entrapments. And this may be mostly uh, entrapment wise the last seminar. And with this, I also invite you all to register for ISSP Con 2024. It will be a mixed bag of scientific programs, very minute, minutely uh, programmed. So don't miss that. Yeah, so without wasting much time, we'll proceed. Yeah, Varsha, we can continue. Okay, just to share our program details because you mentioned about it. So this is the conference we are coming up with, National Annual Pain Conference at Pune. It's 38 pain conference. Okay, so thank you very much. And now I would like to call upon Dr. Bhavesh. Hello. Who is the moderator? Yeah, who is the moderator for today's session? And I would like to introduce him. Just a minute. I am opening his slide. Recording in progress. Recording stopped. Share. Okay. Okay, so am I is my slide visible? Recording in progress. Not yet. Okay. Yeah, this is the now. Okay. So Dr. Bhavesh Shet, he is MD, consultant, anesthesiologist, and interventional pain management consultant. Varsha, can you make yeah. it full screen? Yeah, I made it. It's not yet visible. Okay. Is it yeah, visible? Fine. Absolutely. Yeah. <clears throat> so Dr. Bhavesh Shet is director, consultant, anesthesiologist, and interventional pain management specialist at Sterling Hospital, Nigri, and Imperial Multispecialty Hospital, Chikli. So uh, these are two leading hospitals in Pimpri Chinchwad area, twin city of Pune. And Dr. Bhavesh is a director and pain specialist at this hospital. He has done fellowships in tropical cardiology, FCP, FCCP, and fellowship in spine and pain intervention from IPSC, New Delhi. He had been faculties at many places at conference, workshop, and currently he is a secretary of Society 
for anesthesiologist Pimpri Chinchwa. He has publications to his credit and he has been a very dynamic committee member in Anesthesia Society and now working in Pain Society for our conference work and everything related to Pune Pain Society. So I would like to call upon Dr. Bhavish to start the session. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Varsha, for the kind introduction. And at the outset, I take this opportunity to thank SSPP, our Varshali Kenya, Kenya Madam, and uh, yourself for taking me, giving me chance to moderate this session. Uh, actually, as you said, this is a lower limb nerve entrapment. So we will be having our first speaker, Dr. Archana Nankar. I would like to acknowledge her for I mean, stepping in in the last minute because of uh, ill health of Dr. Nivedita. Thank you, Dr. Archana. I'll read out her CV. She is a consultant pain management at Aditya Birla Memorial Hospital, Chinchwar, Pune, at Dr. D.Y. Patil Medical College Hospital and Research Center, Pimpri, Pune, at Nirame Hospital, Chinchwar, Pune, Minakshi Pain Clinic, Nigri, Pune, Archana Pain Clinic, Baner, Pune. She has done her fellowships in Indian Academy of Pain Medicine, fellowships in pain management, Daradia Pain Clinic, Kolkata, fellowship in nerve block and pain management at Ganga Hospital, Coimbatore. She has other training, ISP, ISSP, evidence-based multidisciplinary pain management course in 2017. Research and publications in her name, she has number of publications in pain three, journal of recent advances in pain. She has co-authored two books chapter, Therapy for Diabetes Mellitus and Related Disorders. In other achievements, she has won first prize in poster competition in WB SSP Con 2020. And she is faculty for live workshop peripheral nerve blocks Proact Pune Con 2016. Welcome Dr. Archana and I request you to share your site please. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you for the kind introduction. Okay. Uh, before I start my lecture, I would like to thank the organizers of SSPP, Dr. Varsha Ma'am and Dr. Kenya Ma'am, and all the SSPP members for giving me this opportunity to present this lecture uh, along with other stalwart speakers like Dr. Anand sir and Dr. Kanchan Ma'am. And um, also, I apologize in advance because this was a last minute uh, thing. So if, if there are any shortcomings in my presentation. Thank you. Okay, uh, so moving on. Um, so my topic is uh, Maralgia Parasitica and Saphenous Nerve Entrapment Export. So, okay, so I'll be uh, starting with the introduction, the basic anatomy, etiology, Diagnosis and Differential Diagnosis, Clinical Evaluation, Investigations and Management. So, Maralgia Parasitica, as everybody, everybody uh, is uh, familiar with, it is a localized uh, sensory symptoms of the outer thigh caused by compression of the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. Its incidence in India is 4.3 in 10,000 patients and uh, uh, it's, it's a purely sensory nerve. So, with any nerve entrapment, we should be thorough with the anatomy. So, uh, the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve, it originates at the, L, it's a part of the lumbar plexus. It originates at the L2, L2 and L3. Then it uh, passes obliquely between the superficial and deep parts of the psoas muscle. Then it passes under the inguinal ligament, uh, very near to the ASIS, anterior superior iliac spine. And then uh, generally it is medial to Two centimeters medial to the ASIS, and then it uh, it lies over the uh, superficial aspect of the sartorius muscle, or sometimes even within the substance of the uh, sartorius muscle. Then uh, most commonly compression, uh, the etiology is most commonly compression under the inguinal ligament, and uh, there may be many causes for this. For example, uh, pregnancy, obesity, tight clothing, belt, leg leg discrepancy, pelvic girdle dysfunction carrying mobile or wallet in front, wallet in front, pocket of pant, uh, then metabolic such as diabetes, mellitus, hypothyroidism, alcoholism, and iatrogenic, that is traction during spine surgery or retroperitoneal dissection. So how does this clinically present? 
So there is basically neuropathic symptoms, so such as uh, there will be tingling, burning, stabbing, aching, pain, sometimes numbness in the anterior lateral thigh. There are no motor sim symptoms because this is a purely sensory nerve. Symptoms are typically aggravated on extending the hip and uh, also aggravated on walking and standing and uh, relieving on relieving relieved on sitting. Uh, what is the differential diagnosis for this? So there can be radiculopathy. Uh, L1 to L3, then iliac crest malignancy, metastasis lesions, pelvic mass compressing the nerve root, chronic appendicitis, ASIS avulsion fracture, among the different differential diagnoses. So, how will you clinically evaluate? So, ma mainly physical exam and history is the main uh, thing in the clinical evaluation. So, there will be characteristic sensory changes over the anterolateral thigh. And with no motor findings. Uh, so there will be uh, tenderness and tinnel sign adjacent to the ASIS. Often the history and physical are sufficient. And provocative maneuvers are hip extension. Then a diagnostic injection. So sometimes you need to give a diagnostic injection to confirm the diagnosis. Then ultrasound, it assists in localizing the LFCN for diagnostic and therapeutic nerve block. MRI is important to exclude other diseases. Then uh, arteriography not that useful. X-ray again uh, to exclude other diseases and electrodiagnostic studies also may rule out other diseases. Then management is generally uh, ultrasound guided hydro dissection. So here you can see the ultrasound picture. So sartorius is medially, rectus femoris and uh, the, uh, this is the tensor facial lighter which is laterally and in between the two muscles is your, sartor, uh, is your uh, sorry, lateral femoral cutaneous nerve of type. So, so ultrasound guided hydro dissection or pulsed RFA of LFCN, that these are your uh, management. Then coming to the next uh, nerve entrapment in the uh, lower limb, that is a saphenous nerve entrapment. So the saphenous nerve is also, also another pure sensory nerve. And uh, when the uh, nerve is subjected to injury or compressive neuropathy, it can develop not only classical neuropathic pain in the distribution of the nerve, but also it may cause cutaneous allodynia and it may sometimes mimic CRPS, complex regional pain syndrome. So with a, and uh, also nowadays it is common in elderly patients who are undergoing uh, TKRs, total knee replacement surgeries, because intrapatellar saphenous neuropathy, which is a branch of the saphenous nerve, is involved in these cases. So uh, that is common nowadays. So coming to the anatomy of the saphenous nerve, so, saphenous nerve, it is again coming from the L3, L4 nerve roots. It branches of the femoral nerve. So, this is here the saphenous nerve, approximately 8 centimeters below the inguinal ligament. Uh, then, uh, then after that, it accompanies the femoral artery uh, through the adductor canal, that is the hunter's canal. And it passes through the vasoadductor membrane to the knee. Uh, the vaso, what is the vasto adductor membrane? So it is a membrane which is formed between the adductor magnus muscle and the vastus medialis muscle. And here you can see the saphenous nerve coursing through the adductor canal. This is the saphenous nerve. Okay. Uh, and uh, this is just about 10 centimeters above the medial femoral condyle. Then the combination, and here it is, uh, as it uh, passes outside the adductor canal, here it is a common site of entrapment of the nerve. Also, as it passes, it divides into branches uh, when it comes out of the adductor canal. So, it divides into an uh, anterior branch and a posterior branch. So, the anterior branch is the IPS nerve or the infrapatellar saphenous nerve and the posterior branch is the sartorial nerve. So, commonly in knee replacement, after knee replacement surgery, the IPS nerve is involved. That is the infrapatellar patellar saphenous nerve. So, uh, etiology. So, uh, so, as we already saw, it, uh, there can be, a, I'm mainly focusing on proximal saphenous nerve entrapment. So, here the etiology commonly is the peripheral edema, then uh, CABG, vein harvest during CABG, then cardiac catheterization, femoral vascular surgery, varicose veins, stripping, kneeling, housemates knee, sports such as surfing, idiopathic. it can be also idiopathic. These are the different sites of saphenous nerve entrapment. Uh, then... Uh, also, in cases of infrapatellar saphenous nerve injury, so there can be post TKR, patellar tendon harvest, hamstring tendon ar harvest, arthroscopy, medial knee trauma, knee joint injection, idiopathic again. So, 70% post TKR incidence is very high in post TKR cases. So, how will you, how, will, how does it present? So, depending on the uh, 
site of the entrapment uh, the uh, pain will be according accordingly so for example uh, if surgery in the groin is causing the entrapment then uh, generally the pain uh, is in, in in the groin or the medial upper thigh then if uh, it is in the distal thigh the entrapment then the symptoms are in the knee often extending down the medial calf and sometimes proximally to the hip or the lower abdomen as well and if if the uh, infrapatellar patellar saphenous nerve is involved the in, the pain is more localized to the knee so uh, so if the saphenous nerve is entrapped in the adductor canal then generally the pain is in the knee calf thigh region the motor function will be normal since it's a sensory nerve tenderness over the adductor canal women are predominantly affected a uh, patient's leg may feel heavy and uh, sometimes it may simulate claudication because it is aggravated on walking and standing almost 70% of patients may also complain of night pain or pain at rest which is very severe then in case of ips or infrapatellar saphenous nerve entrapment uh generally uh, anterior knee pain will be there mostly medially and the medial calf this, this is the location of the pain and the pain is characteristically neuropathic again burning tingling allodynia uh patient may walk stiff legged due to and may avoid flexion of the knee then also it may mimic crps okay uh, the joint may be red hot swollen sometimes and uh, but the inflammatory markers will be normal and uh, also uh, there will be visible swelling in the medial tibial fossa and this is the area of tenderness for the uh, infrapatellar saphenous neuropathy so what is the differential diagnosis so again lumbar radiculopathy venous insufficiency medial tibial stress fracture arterial insufficiency sartorial tendonitis pes anserine bursitis medial collateral ligament injury hip joint pathology so these are the different differential diagnosis again investigations so emg ncv study may be done which may reveal increased latency then mri has to be done of the popliteal fossa or the knee to rule out other causes of medial knee pain and ultrasonography is used mainly for therapeutic block purpose or diagnostic block purpose uh, so what is the treatment again ultrasound guided hydrodissection and steroid injection then pulsed rfa if the pain recurs and lastly surgery surgical deep if intractable pain is still exists thank you thank you dr rachna yes thank you sir uh, is there any questions uh, from the hello shall we take the questions in the end yeah no problem madam then we'll go ahead with the okay then uh, we'll start with the uh, second uh, talk dr anand murugesan dr bhave just a minute my screen was frozen i will share the cv dr anand let me share oh. your cv <clears throat> oh okay okay just a second yeah yeah it's here can you see yes yes i can see dr anand murugesan uh, sir has uh, done fellowship in interventional pain management september 2011 with dr gp dureja in delhi pain management center india fellowship training in chronic pain management in april 2012 and april 2013 with dr ram pasupulleti center for pain management bowling green kentucky uh, usa fellowship training in chronic pain management in april 2012 and april 2013 with dr sanapati uh, mahendra in advanced pain care center evansville indiana usa fellowship training in chronic pain management 
22nd April 2012 to 4th May 2012 with Dr. Philip Peng, Toronto Western Hospital University Health Network, Toronto, Canada, Fellow of Interventional Pain Practice, FIPP, in May 2018 in King's College, London, Certified Interventional Pain Sonologist, CIPS, in May 2018 in King's College, London, Winner of COPS Award in Post-Operative Pain Management for the year 2009, issued by Indian Society of Anesthesiologists. Sir is moderator, faculty and panelist for various cadaver workshops conducted in India. He is invited speaker and panelist in London Pain Forum. Currently working as a senior consultant in the Department of Anesthesia and Pain Palliative Care in Apollo Main Hospital, Grims Road, Chennai. Apollo Cancer Institute, Tenampet, Chennai, and Apollo Proton Cancer Center, Chennai. Sir is the Director, Panacea Pain Management Center, Chennai. And Sir has more than 10 publications in interventional pain management. Welcome, Sir. I think Sir can start sharing his talk. Oh, am I audible? Yes, yes. Ah, I guess. Yes, you're um, audible. Your screen is also visible. Oh, okay, fine. Um, thanks, Dr. Bavish, for the kind introduction of myself, and I should thank Dr. Varshali, ma'am, and Dr. Varsha for this opportunity to speak in this uh, webinar conducted by um, Society of Indian Society of Study of Pain Pune. I was really taken aback knowing like such a wonderful. Uh, uh, sessions are happening in ISSP Pune. I think uh, I'm really envy and sometimes jealous, you know, seeing the active participation from the Pune chapter of ISSP. So glad to be the part of it. So I thank one and all for uh, uh, keeping me in this forum. So uh, in fact, I have to thank once again for uh, Varsha ma'am and Varsha Ali for giving this topic because like this is one of my favorite topic uh, I do. Uh, teach in most of the forums. So with that, like, uh, I would like to just start the discussion. So I'm going to discuss about the uh, pyriformis uh, muscle syndrome and the pudental nerve entrapment. So I made it so simple, like, I just would like to give the brief references, like, to uh, make the audience understand the importance of these syndromes and the pudental nerve entrapments, because this is a so-called considered as the niche area unlike your upper limb. Um, like, you know, in the most of these uh, lower limb entrapment, so much so for uh, pyriformis and pudental, which is always an overlooked symptom or an underdiagnosed symptom. So that's why I take this like and I make it uh, so simplified uh, to understand this problem and then uh, how to go about in diagnosing the uh, entrapments and then further management as well. So I made a special video uh, exclusively for this webinar uh, um, elaborating the uh, piriformis muscle anatomy and the pudental nerve anatomy in the pelvis model and also I made the live video on a volunteer of ultrasound scanning demonstrating these two uh, anatomical structures. So uh, there, there are not many um, uh, publications or literature available on uh, these areas. So there is uh, one uh, um, article which is nice in that uh, uh, Bone and the Mechanical Region Journal. Uh, it's actually a systemic review. So this is perhaps the only systemic review on uh, the pel posterior pelvis syndrome. So it is called the deep gluteal syndrome. Then it is re-termed as your pyriformis syndrome later. So it's a quite recent study about the uh, 2022, like where it was studied extensively about like how a sciatic, sciatica is like misdiagnosed or the uh, pudental entrapment is di misdiagnosed for sciatica. So it's vice versa. It's such a, a wonderful systemic review, which clearly states uh, 40 to 50 percentage of so-called sciatic of the spinal origin could be because of the nerve entrapment. 
So it's such a big prevalence of this deep gluteal syndrome, which is often diagnosed as uh, uh, the sciatic of the spinal origin. So a systematic approach has been uh, clearly explained uh, in the discussion part of this article, which states like when a patient is having a gluteal pain, it has to be uh, evaluated in terms of the differential diagnosis, not just the sciatic nerve of spinal origin. It's a good article on the deep. That's why it's mentioned as a deep gluteal syndrome. It's not the sciatica. So another one is from the pain practice, one of the renowned pain practice about the pyriformis syndrome, it prevalence. So this particular article states 17 percentage prevalence of the pyriformis syndrome of a patient with gluteal pain, which is actually quite, uh, quite a bit. 17 percent is like like of 100 patients with uh, with a gluteal pain, 17 may have a pyriformis syndrome, like which we need to um, diagnose it, have it in a, as, as we rightly say, like what the mind does not know, the eyes will not see. So unless we think in that line, we will be always evaluating in terms of uh, spinal origin of the sciatica. We'll do a repeated MRI scanning, blah, 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 so much and so forth. So having an, a clear understanding about this deep gluteal pain syndrome, is uh, very important in uh, uh, evaluating a patient uh, or uh, or a patient with a gluteal pain. So the, there is so much mention about the modified fat, uh, fat test, which is a flexion, adduction, and the internal rotation of the test, which stretches the piriformis muscle and then reproduces the sciatica pain. So it has got more uh, sensitivity. Along with this, these days we are doing a diagnostic uh, piriformis intramuscular injection. Both are the gold standards right now to confirm the piriformis syndrome. It's such a wonderful paper uh, with more emphasis on this uh, FAIR test and the diagnostic intramuscular piriformis injection uh, with the maximum sensitivity and uh, specificity respectively. And uh, uh, one more study uh, in uh, Physical Medicine Rehabilitation Journal by Daniel Probe. It's, he has clearly explained, it's, a, it's again a review, it's a review article about the anatomy, diagnosis and treatment. It's a very, very exhaustive about the differential diagnosis of the gluteal, uh, deep gluteal structures. And it's not just the pudental nerve entrapments, it's, it's been explained in detail about the entrapment of even the sciatic nerve at the deep gluteal region. So it's again an article extensively studied on the pyriformis syndrome and uh, focusing more on the differential diagnosis rather than uh, we evaluate the uh, gluteal pain with only uh, in terms of the uh, uh, sciatica. So with regards to the pudental entrapment neuropathy, so again a nice article from the pain physician about a rare comp, it's a case study clearly mentioned about the pelvic radiation, I mean pel post pelvic radiation uh, induced uh, pudental uh, uh, neurologia, pudental neuropathy. So like it's again one of the complication of the cancer treatment in particular radiation therapy like uh, it is generally not thought so uh, like the radiation can cause fibrosis of the deep gluteal areas in and around the pyriformis uh, I mean uh, py pyriformis muscle and in and around the pudental nerve of the uh, pelvic area and the fibrosis over there can cause the pudental nerve entrapment leading on to uh, the classical signs and symptoms of the perineal and the periana. So it's very classical. Perineal is like uh, the vulvovaginal pain and the uh, penile pain in males. And the uh, perianal pain is the distal urethra and the distal anal and perianal pain. It's a very classical neuropathic pain character like pins and needles burning type um, involving the perineal and the perianal area. So this is a nice article about the pelvic, I mean, uh, post-radiation induced uh, uh, pudental neuro neuralgia. So another article, uh, another one came in the same pain physicians about the uh, the criteria. This uh, this is pretty much interesting, you know, like uh, what is a criteria to say it's a entrapment. So I would like to mention about this criteria a little more time, you know, because there is a, it's called five essential diagnostic criteria. This differentiates the pudental neuralgia in particular about uh, the nerve entrapment with with uh, the other uh, pudental neuralgia of other causes. Um, so Nandi's criteria is 
so particular and sensitive for only the entrapments of the pudental nerve. So what are these five diagnostic criteria? It's very simple. The first criteria is like it should follow the distribution of the pudental nerve, like the perianal and the perineal pain. Second thing, pain should be reproduced on sitting. As simple as that, because if pain is on, if the if the pain is on lying down position, it, it can't be called as uh, nerve entrapment because only when you sit, the nerve can get triggered or the nerve can get stretched between the ligaments where it commonly gets entrapped. So that it, pain on sitting is another criteria to say uh, pudental nerve entrapment syndrome or the symptom. And another thing is like the sleep, like pain should not, as I said, pain on sitting and pain should not be on sleeping. So the night pain, the rest pain is so classical of the neuralgia, neuralgia of the sacral root pathology, which is the cause for the pudental nerve. It's not the cause for the entrapment. For entrapment neuropathy to happen in pudental nerve, it should be in a sitting posture, not on the lying down. So, and another uh, important criteria is the positive diagnostic test. Positive diagnostic, if you have to give the pudental nerve block and then the pain should get relieved. This little bit lacks the specificity because this, uh, this is a completion criteria because, you know, even without a nerve entrapment, if some other uh, uh, cause for the pudental neuralgia, your pudental nerve block can relieve the pain. So, this has little less specificity when compared to the other four uh, Nandis criteria of uh, pudental uh, neuralgia due to the nerve entrapment. So, this study in Pain Physician uh, 2001 says about the treatment of the uh, uh, pudental neuralgia of uh, entrapment etiology with a pulsed radio frequency. So, like we are, uh, as we know, the pudental nerve is a mixed nerve. It's uh, sensory and motor. And uh, uh, in the motor, it has got a major supply to the external anal sphincter and external urethral sphincter. So, the lesioning uh, or the ablation of this mixed nerve can cause, you know, uh, the weakness of the uh, sphincter uh, and then the incontinence of the uh, urine and the um, um, defecation. So, like the pulse is advised and there is a nice study about the successful treatment of the pudental neuralgia uh, which is refractory to medical management with pulse radio frequency. And uh, there is one more nice article in Journal of Ultrasonography about ultrasound guided injection in pelvic entrapment in neuropathies, here more discussion on a uh, hydrodissection. Like hydrodissection is a procedure done specific for the nerve entrapments where you should see the nerve. See, that's the advantage of an ultrasound over the fluoroscopy, like where you see the nerve, you go in and around the nerve, you inject the fibrous and dextrose that dissects the nerve from the surrounding fibrous tissue and nerve gets released from the entrapment. So the ultrasound is gaining in pelvic entrapment neuropathies because we are so specific the needle tip is so uh, so close and and above in and around the nerve and uh, when you uh, deliver the five percent dextrose it is going to dissect it's it's another uh, uh, interesting um, uh, article about the treatment of uh, nerve entrapments with hydrodissection so now let's move on to a live demonstration which i'm going to uh, uh, talk only about the nerve track nerve tracking Hello, hi everyone. I am Dr. Anand Murugeshan, Senior Anesthesiologist and Interventional Pain Specialist, Apollo Proton Cancer Center, Apollo Hospital Main and Apollo Hospital uh, Tenampet. So today um, I'm going to uh, give you a overview about the pudental nerve, its origin, its course, and where and all it can get entrapped. See, pudental nerve is a very important nerve because it is the nerve and it's the somatic nerve supply to the anal area and the perineal area for both men and women. So, which is highly innervative and it has got its both sensory and motor inner, inner, uh, innervation both. So, the root value of the pudental nerve, how the pudental nerve starts? The pudental nerve starts from the sacral flexus. It is originating from the anterior primary ramae or the ventral primary ramae of S2, S3, S4. Uh, at the sacral flexus and then it starts from the pelvic cavity and then comes outside the pelvic cavity via the greater sciatic notch. Again, re-enter into the pelvic cavity and then it supplies the perineal area. 
So the origin is from the sacral flexus from S2, S3, S4. It has got both sensory and motor. So it is a mixed now. So if you can just look into this model briefly, I can tell you exactly its course. So this is a posterior pelvis. This is the sacrum. This is the iliac bone. This is the pubic bone. And this is the ischium bone. And this is the pubic bone. And you can see a big notch called greater sciatic notch and a smaller notch called lesser sciatic notch. So as I said, it is originating from the sacral flexus, which means it is starting from, you can see the S1, S2, S3, S4. So the root value is S2, S3, S4 from the respective foramen, the anterior primary amide, and then it forms inside the pelvis along the concavity or otherwise called the anterior sac sacrum. So as it forms in the anterior sacrum, it comes outside the pelvis via a foramen called greater sciatic foramen. So it exceeds the pelvis, comes outside through the sciatic, greater sciatic foramen. As it comes outside the greater sciatic foramen, it will encounter a muscle called pyriformis muscle and ischiococcygeus muscle. It goes between these two muscles as it exits the pelvic cavity. So the pyriformis muscle is a pear-shaped muscle. It starts from the anterior sacrum and comes and attaches at the greater trochanter of the femur. So this is the greater trochanter of the femur and this is the anterior sacrum. So this is the course of the pyriformis muscle. So as the pudental now exits the a sacrum, pelvic cavity uh, um, across the greater sciatic notch, it courses between the pyriformis muscle, which is superficial, and ischiococcygeus muscle, which is deep. So this is one area where it is coursing through the two muscles, a canal, where a potential space it can get entrapped. As it crosses the pyriformis muscle, it again goes to a second tunnel. It's called ligamental tunnel. So, which means there is two ligaments. One is the sacrospinous ligament, which is the superficial ligament, and the sacrotuberous ligament, which is deep. So after it crosses the pyriformis muscle, it goes through the tunnel formed by super superficially the sacrospinous ligament and deep sacrotuberous ligament. So this is the second place where it can get entrapped. So after it crosses the sacrospinous and sacrotuberous canal or the tunnel, now the time, the nerve again, the exited nerve from the pelvic cavity again re-enters the pelvis through a canal called Alcox canal. This is an Alcox canal and this is the greater sciatic foramen, sorry, lesser sciatic foramen. So after it crosses the lesser sciatic foramen, it goes in a tunnel called Alcox canal. This Alcox canal is formed by the fascia of the operator internus muscle. So always this nerve is, pudental nerve is accompanied by internal pudental artery and the vein. So uh, then it courses via this Alcox canal and re-enters the pelvic cavity and comes anterior and superior. See, that is anterior because we are, this is a posterior pelvis. So it goes anterior and superior and supplies the pelvic area. This is the pelvis. This, sorry, this is the perineum. So it supplies the perineum. So the sensory supply of the a uh, pudental nerve is superior, it is uh, predominantly it is three branches. One is the superior rectal branch, which supplies the lower anal canal and the perianal skin. The second is the perineal nerve, which supplies the clitoris, vagina and vulva in female and the uh, skin, uh, um, the perineal area of the men. Then at last, that perineal nerve continues or terminates as the dorsal nerve of penis in men and dorsal nerve of clitoris in women. So this is the origin, course and where it can get entrapped and the sensory supply and the motor supply of the pudental nerve. So what is the clinical anatomy? The clinical anatomy here is, it is a mixed nerve. So as I said, it is a mixed nerve, it has got sensory and motor. So motor muscles, which are very important, it supplies the bulbocavernosis, 
ischio cavernosis muscle and levator anine muscles in levator anine uh, group of muscles you know it is pubo rectalis pubo coccygeus and ilio coccygeus muscle and last but not the least it is supplying the uh, sphincters both external urethral sphincters and external anal sphincters which are very important for controlling the uh, um, urination and defecation so such an important now we need to be extremely careful in dealing with it if it gets entrapped so knowing the patient anatomy and the zone anatomy is very important to identify the uh, dental nerve first and to identify where it can entrap and to treat it now let's go into the zone anatomy hi so we discussed about the patient anatomy uh, now we are going to look into the zone anatomy so the patient is positioned prone and we have to choose a curved linear probe which is a low frequency probe because posterior pelvis is a deeper structure and the piriformis muscle pudental nerve is a deeper structure so we need to have a low frequency probe so you can see the patient is positioned prone and then i have taken the linear probe so now how i am going to start with see always any now any structure in ultrasound you have to have a tracking system it is very difficult like a fluoroscopic anatomy to go and then identify the flow, uh, anatomy at one shot in ultrasound the advantage and disadvantage is the same that is the dynamicity so once you take the probe off the structure goes off again reproducing the same is going to be tricky and difficult it takes time so rather you have a systematic approach of how to end up on a right target so that is called tracking so to start the tracking you have to start from the familiar structure so that it will be easy to reproduce even if you take the probe off and the vision goes still you can again restart it and you can reach the target comfortably so that is called the tracking so in pudental now the easiest structure the comfortable structure to start with is your sacral hiatus uh so you can see now how the probe is placed here it's a low frequency probe curvilinear probe i'm exactly placing it on the sacral hiatus it's a transverse view so once i said it's a transverse view now i would like to show exactly here in the um, sonography can you show the ultrasound now you can see the ultrasound there if you can look into the ultrasound we can zoom it and then show because now i have chosen 9 cm because as i said it's a 8 to 10 cm deeper structure so um the sacral hiatus is superficial so that's why it is uh, seen here you can see two horns can you see two horns it's the sacral cornua and this is your sacrum so what is seen in between is the caudal epidural space so now it is any nobody can miss it it's a, we call this as a frog side you can see one eye of the frog and the other eye of the frog so now as i scan upwards and careful at so this will a and then the frog's eye will become a peak now you can see see so you can just look at it see now it's going away going away going away going away and then what you see is a peak it's a peak sign or a tower sign so this peak is the s3 medial crest as we all know the sacral hiatus is a deficiency of s4 and s5 uh, lamina and spinous process so we don't have s4 and s5 lamina and spinous process but we do have s3 so the first structure prominent structure we see above the sacral cornua is your s3 medial crest now i'm going above the s3 this will go away yeah this is getting flattened and we'll get the another big prominence that is s2 can you see this is much more prominent than s3 so this is s2 so now again i'm going up where i can see much more prominent structure here yeah, can you see much more prominent structure that is s1 so s1 spinous process is bigger than s2 and s2 spinous process is bigger than s3 so as i come to s1 i have to come can you show here please can you show the probe yeah 
you can see here i am in the midline i am now slightly coming towards lateral now you can show the screen so now i am coming to the lateral as i come lateral you can see two structures one is as i said s1 spinous process and this is the posterior superior iliac spine or the iliac bone so this is is uh, sacrum this is ilium that we all know what it is it's the sacroiliac joint you can see the deficiency here that's the can you see this is the joint so this is the sacroiliac joint and this is the s1 foramen so now having seen the iliac bone so i would like to keep the iliac bone in the center of the screen so now this is the iliac bone center of the screen and what you seen is the waterfall sign it is like the water falling like this so this is the gluteus muscle gluteus maximus gluteus minimus and gluteus medius muscle in sequence from super, some superficial to the deep and this is the iliac bone you can see the nice contouring of the iliac bone so now i would like to see the pa uh, patient's uh, anatomy here can you please show here yeah so now i came from midline to the lateral and position the iliac bone in the middle of the ultrasound screen now i am going to come so superior to the inferior and then try to track the uh, pudental nerve here so now again go back to the ultrasound screen so now if you see the ultrasound screen you see the continuous contouring of the iliac bone as a single line so now as i start scanning down as i start scanning down you can see this continuity will be lost at one point of time you can see now there will be a break if you can see still it is continuous still it is continuous can you see it started breaking see here it is continuous here it is started breaking so this first break is the greater sciatic foramen or the notch this is the place where the pudental now exceeds the pelvis and comes out so let me show where it comes so once the sciatic foramen forms so this break there is a break in the iliac bone continuity as is this is the sacral notch you can see it's completely break and this curvature is the greater sciatic notch so now again i started scanning down as i start scanning down you can see a beautiful muscle as soon as the greater sciatic notch is formed we can see the muscle here see this is the skin subcutaneous tissue a bulk gluteus maximus muscle and below this muscle what is this muscle is the piriformis muscle so this particular uh, model is actually a young model so you can see a nice thick bulk of the piriformis muscle below the gluteus maximus see this thick is the gluteus maximus and below the gluteus maximus is your piriformis muscle so how to know confirm it is the piriformis muscle so now what i do is i'm just slightly can you show his leg please so now what i am going to do is i am bending the patient's leg at the knee and then doing a internal and the external rotation as i do here you can see the can you please show the screen as i do here you can see the movement of the muscle bhaiya kaise waisa karte raho can you see the movement of the muscle yeah yes sir that is the piriform that piriform is we make it little fast forward the big becomes linear you see now the curve becomes straight curve becomes straight so once it becomes straight it is called ischial spine so now the next structure is the ischial spine we are in the ischial bone we have crossed the iliac bone and we are in the ischial bone so now this thick piriformis muscle has thinned down and one more new structure has formed this structure is the most important structure is the sciatic nerve 
The sciatic now is exactly underneath the piriformis muscle. Mm. Like your pudental now, which is S2, S3, S4, anterior primary rami, the sciatic now formed from L4, L5, S1, S2, S3, and sometimes from S4 or sometimes from L3. So it's such a big now, which is exactly underneath the piriformis muscle. So what happens? This sciatic now can get entrapped if there is a spasm of the piriformis muscle. So sometimes the sciatic pain need not be always due to the lumbar disc bulge, need not be always due to the nerve impingement at the spinal level. It can be at the level of the piriformis where this piriformis muscle spasm can impinge on this particular nerve. See, now the nerve is in between the ischial spine and the piriformis muscle. So if the nerve, the muscle is spasm, if the muscle goes for spasm, the piriformis muscle goes for spasm, it can trigger the sciatica. So this is where one entrapment happens. So now, where is the pudental nerve now? Still now I have not told about the pudental nerve, I told about the sciatic nerve. So having reached this structure, what we have to do is we have to go medially. Can you please show the patient here? So now we are lateral. So now I showed the ischial spine. I showed the sciatic nerve. Now I have to move the probe slightly medial. Now you can show the uh, picture here. Can you show the picture here? So now, as I said, this is the ischial spine. This is the sciatic nerve. You can see a beautiful pulsation here. That is the pudental artery. You can see that pudental artery pulsation. It's a very nice pudental pulsation. And you can see that this is a pudental artery pulsation. Can you just zoom those zoom here? This particular thing, zoom, can you zoom it? So now you can see if you can, if you are uh, to observe, you can see the small artery pulse. That's a pudental artery. So now Having told pudental artery, see now where is the pudental nerve? See, this is the only place where the nerve or one of the few places where the nerve is medial to the artery. So this is the sciatic nerve, which is lateral to the pudental nerve, but the pudental nerve is medial to the pudental artery. See, this particular ischial spine is continuous as the sacrospinous ligament. So, the sacrospinous ligament, if you can see, I'll show you. So now you can see the sciatic now much better. You can see the sciatic now much better and you can see the pudental artery. See now, there is some, you can see the, the ischial spine ends here. After this, there is a continuation here. So that is the sacrospinous ligament, which is connecting from the sacromedially to the ischial spine of the pelvis. So now, medial to the artery where the sacrospinous ligaments go deep and sacrotuberous ligament comes superficial is where the nerve comes. See, this is the pudental artery. I said, can you see here? That's the pudental nerve. It's a, such a big nerve, you can't miss it. It is present between the tunnel of the sacrospinous ligament and the sacrotuberous ligament. And the structure which is which separates this is the pudental artery. So pudental artery separates the sciatic nerve from the pudental nerve. So that is the landmark. So this is one place where the Pudental nerve gets entrapped. You can see this is the pudental nerve. So media, laterally is the sciatic nerve, medial is the pudental nerve, and in between is the sciat, uh, pudental artery. So now having seen the pudental nerve at the ischial spine level, you keep this as the center, the ischial spine. So now the ischial straight has become a curved one. Can you see the curved one? This is the ischial tuberosity. So the ischial spine is straight and ischial tuberosity is curved. Can you show here? So this is ischial spine which is proximal and then slightly I'm curving it down and then the ischial spine becomes ischial tuberosity. Can you show here? Please. So now 
This is the ischial tuberosity. So you can see again a pulsation here. You can, if you see here, there is a pulsation here. You can beautiful. Can you zoom it here in that red dot? The pointer, can you zoom? So now you can see the pulsation there. That is again the pudental artery. Just medial to the pudental artery is the pudental nerve. You can see the hyperechoic structure is the pudental. What is this? Is the obturator internus muscle. So as I said, the fascia of the obturator internal muscle forms a tunnel where the pudental nerve and the pudental artery and the pudental vein, all three will enter. From outside the pelvis, it re-enters the pelvis like this. It enters like this and again goes anteriorly and superiorly and supplies the perineum. So what is very important about the Alcox canal is, before Alcox canal, before the pudental nerve enters the Alcox canal, the superior rectal nerve and the inferior rectal nerve gets branched out. So when you want to block the pudental nerve at the Alcox canal, the superior rectal nerve is spared because at this level, it separates and goes and sub supplies the rectal and perianal area and the distal anal canal. But this, uh, after the Alcox canal, only the perineal nerve continues. The perineal nerve, as I said, supplies the perineal uh, structures of male and female and continues as the dorsal nerve of the penis in male and dorsal nerve of the clitoris in female. So this is one place where, again, the fascia of the operator internus can go for um, a stiffness or a sclerosis or calcification and it can cause the entrapment here. So this is the third place where the uh, pudental nerve can entrap. So to put it in the nutshell, the pudental nerve can get entrapped. See, this is again I'm coming from um, uh, the ischial, um, the I think it got hanged, Dr. Yeah, so I think, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think yeah, yeah. Uh, almost I done with uh, most of the entrapment. Sorry, I had taken uh, more time because as I was doing the tracking, uh, it's difficult to stop in between. I think uh, most of the entrapment sites have been mentioned. So I think that's why another five minutes, I just cut it off. I, it's the repetition. I just over briefed it from the beginning. So that's why I stopped it. So thanks for uh, the opportunity and... Uh, and I think uh, this video, I made it so uh, uh, simple, like, you know, instead of showing it as a slide, I think it, it makes sense if I can show it in the model. So it's an effort I took exclusively for this webinar I did day before yesterday, and then to make things uh, simple. So thanks once again for this opportunity, and I have to thank the organizers for the uh, making me to talk on this topic. Thank you so much. Uh, and I thank Dr. Babesh also for moderating me on this um, topic. Thank you, sir. Very nice presentation. I think we'll move on to our uh, third speaker, uh, Dr. Kanchan Sharma. Hi, Dr. Varsha, can you please share the introduction slide? Uh, Dr. Kanchan Sharma is the director at Adhya Pain Management Center, Jaipur. He is qualified MD, FIPM, Focus, Fundamentals and MSK, and RMSK, APCA USA, PhD Pain Management, Secondary Scholar. Her area of interest is MSK Pain and Ultrasound. Her achievements, she is co-author of MSK USG in Pain Book, co-editor of Basic in Pain Management Book, author of book chapters, clinical methods in pain medicine, and handbook of pain and palliative medicine, inventor of ATM approach, one finger and bone first technique for the identification of elbow structures with ultrasound, recipient of best PG paper, best erudite, woman excellence in pain management, and pain ambassador award and pain brain tournament winner. She is co-author for PRP guidelines for osteoarthritis knee. She is faculty in Orthopedic Academy, England, UK, fellowship in pain management basic and advanced fellowship in MSK 
अल्ट्रासाउंड गाइड ए फ्रॉम एशियन पेन मेडिसिन वेलकम मैडम प्लीज स्टार्ट शेयरिंग योर स्लाइड thank you so much dr bavesh for the kind introduction and uh, before i start my presentation i would like to thank society for study of pain pune and especially dr varsha and dr varshali ma'am for this wonderful opportunity i am really very much elated to be here on board with all of you uh so let me share my screen i hope my slides are visible and i am audible Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So today I will be talking about the foot's hidden agony. and uh, since the theme for today's presentation is all about the nerves so i will be talking about the plantar foot pain where i'll be covering the entrapment neuropathies of the tibial nerve and its branches so these are my references for today's presentation and if a patient who has got an entrapment neuropathy either of the tibial nerve or it branches so he might present to you with a foot pain and this presentation is going to be very much you know uh, i should say overlapping so you need to be very much precise in you know uh, taking the history doing the clinical examination and then you should be formulating the clinical diagnosis and yes because we are all ultrasound freak so ultrasound really plays a very important role here so this patients they can have a pain which will be there over the whole of your plantar foot you can have a pain on the lateral side on the medial side or you know can have the pain over this heel area or um, over the medial side of the heel as well so right so you can have varied presentation of the pain so before we go into our topic proper let's have an idea about the uh, tibial nerve uh, anatomy because uh, that's this will really be helping you a lot in understanding how exactly the things are going on when you are just evaluating a patient so this tibial nerve it enters this tarsal sorry so this tibial nerve it enters this tarsal tunnel which stretches from which is basically present on the posterior medial aspect of the ankle below the medial malleolus and it goes up to the medial side of the plantar foot right so you have the flexor uh, you know the retinaculum which will be forming the roof and the floor will be formed by the posterior medial aspect of this talus medial aspect of this navicular and the medial surface of your calcaneum right now this surgeons they uh, believe in calling it as a proximal tarsal tunnel and a distal tarsal tunnel so they say what exactly is beneath this flexor retinaculum um i'm sorry for my handwriting i have a sprain in my you know wrist joint so this uh, uh you know something which is beneath your flexor retinaculum we are going to call it as proximal tarsal tunnel right and something which is beneath this abductor hallucis muscle we are going to call it as distal tarsal tunnel now what is the most important thing which you need to uh, you know understand here is now beneath this uh, abductor hallucis you have another you know an interfacial compartment now this compartment what exactly happens is you have the septations from the fascia uh of your you know the deeper aspect of the abductor hallucis and it goes up to the calcaneus and which in turn will be causing will be just you know seg i should say separating this uh, layer into a medial plantar medial uh, plantar tunnel and a lateral plantar tunnel through which your nerves will nerves along with your blood vessels and the tendons they will be going uh, they will be just passing through now when it comes to tibial nerve do remember that it is not always you know what i have uh, written here it happens you have lots of anatomical variations when it comes to the division of the tibial nerve so this tibial nerve can divide within the uh, i should say the fibro osseous tarsal tunnel 
or you can have a division of this tibial nerve above that as well. Now, this tibial nerve, we are just taking it that it is dividing inside the tarsal tunnel. So, this will be dividing into the lateral plantar, medial plantar, and the medial calcaneal. Fine. Now, this medial calcaneal again has got a varied presentation. So, this nerve can be a part, can be a branch from the tibial nerve, or you can have a branch from these two plantar nerve as well. Coming to this inferior calcaneal, again, there is a twist. In 80% of the individuals, you will see that it is a branch from the lateral plantar nerve. But this doesn't hold true in the 20% of the other individuals. Now, if you look at the sensory innervation, the two-third of the plantar foot is supplied by the medial plantar nerve and one-third is by the lateral plantar nerve. And this heel area is by the medial calcaneal nerve. Now, this medial plantar nerve, this tibial nerve now has divided into these three, right? So, this medial plantar will be now passing beneath this abductor hollis and it's a very, very important muscle. Do remember when you are talking about the entrapment neuropathies of your tibial nerve and its branches. So, this abductor hollis muscle, beneath that you have your medial plantar nerve which will be going and then it will be dividing into a proper digital which will be supplying the medial aspect of the great toe and then the common digitals, which will be supplying the other two and a half toes. Here, what you need to remember is this abductor hollisis, then you have your flexor hollisis brevis, then you have your flexor digitorum, along with the first lumbrical, right, that will be supplied by your medial plantar nerve. When it comes to the lateral plantar nerve, now this lateral plantar nerve also will be lying, you know, in that lateral plantar tunnel. Once the tibial nerve has divided into medial, medial has gone through the medial plantar tunnel and this lateral has now come through the lateral plantar tunnel. And initially, this will be lying beneath this, your abductor hollisis and then the quadratus plantae and then between the flexor, um, I should say the digitorum brevis and the quadratus plantae. And then it comes to the lateral side and where it will be dividing into a deep branch and a superficial branch. So this deep branch will be supplying all the muscles which are not even supplied by your, which uh, are not supplied by your medial plantar nerve. So what all, what all muscles are they? So you have your flexor digiti minimi, then you have your quadratus plantae, then you have your all the introsius and all the lumbricals except the first one because that was supplied that will be supplied by your medial plantar nerve and you do have your adductor hollisis which will also be supplied by this medial by this lateral plantar nerve now the superficial branch will be just for the cutaneous innervation which we have already seen then coming to this inferior calcaneal and we are assuming that, you know, it is now a branching from the lateral plantar nerve, right? I'm not taking into account the other anatomical variations for this uh, presentation's sake. We are just taking that it is branching from the lateral plantar nerve. Now, this nerve, do remember that it has got a vertical course, right, which you can see here. So, initially, you will be seeing that it will be passing beneath your abductor right? And your quadratus plenty, and then it becomes horizontal like this. And then here it will be lying between your flexor digitorum brevis and quadratus plenty, and then finally it will be supplying your abductor digiti minimi. Now, this is a short video which I have made because we have learned the anatomy. So, let's see how everything looks under solo anatomy. So, the patient will be in the lateral position and this medial side is up. I'm using a linear transducer and I've just placed it just over the posterior colliculus. And once I have placed it, you are supposed to see your tip. Okay. You will be seeing the tibialis posterior, then your flexor digitorum, and then it's the tibial artery. And if I'll just compress, the vessels will, uh, the veins will go away and then Let's see. Okay, so that slide has moved. Okay, let me go back. Just a minute, I need to switch off the pen. Okay. 
and I need to clear the arrays. Okay. So again, sorry for that. Again, we are starting up. So the patient is in the lateral position and this side is up. I'm using a linear probe with the aspect marker towards the posterior calliculus, right? So this is your tibialis posterior. Then you have your extensor digitorum. And since this vessels, they have collapsed. So they are the veins. This is the artery. This is your nerve. And always remember just beneath that you are having your FHL and this FHL will be having a muscle belly. That is your flexor retinaculum, right? Now this is the talus which has come. Now you keep on scanning down. You keep on scanning down and you will see that this tibial nerve will be, you know, dividing into its branches. So once you're reaching the sustentaculum telly, you will be able to see all the branches very nicely. So let me stop it here. So this will be your medial plantar. This is your lateral plantar. And here you will see that the inferior calcaneal will be going like that. And you will see this medial calcaneal, uh, calcaneal which will be going up. To, so once you are just coming towards the abductor holesis, right? So you will be able to see the medial calcaneal, which will be sitting on its top. And these three in the interfacial layer between your abductor holesis and the quadratus plantae. So now you'll see. So here you just tilt the probe so that you will be able to see the leaf-like abductor, you know, holesis. This is the muscle. You will be able to see the medial calcaneal there. This is medial plantar, this is lateral plantar, and if you go in this interfacial plane, you will be able to see the inferior calcaneal there. So this is very important, right? Uh, because uh, again, it has started. Yeah, these things are very important because you can have lots of anatomical variations. And if you really know what exactly is the common presentation, so you will be able to find the abnormal presentations in a go. Then coming to the etiology, this is very, very important. Always remember when you are talking about the tibial nerve entrapment, you know, either of the nerve main trunk or its branches, it's always the foot deformity that should come first in your mind, right? Lots of problems there just because the patient is pronating his foot, right? And there's a very simple way to find out whether he is having a pronated foot or not, right? That is pronation is basically a combination of, you can remember it's a dorsiflexion, then you have abduction and you have aversion, right? Something like this. So he will be walking on the medial border of the foot. Now in this condition, there'll be a compression, not only of the tarsal tunnel, but also of the plantar medial uh, and the lateral plantar tunnel as well. So if he's walking like this, means pronation is not only will be causing a pressure on the main trunk of the tibial nerve, but it will at the same time, this will be causing the pressure on the medial and the lateral plantar tunnel as well, right? So you will be having an aggravation of the symptoms of the main or the branches. Now, a very easy manner to look for whether he is able to pronate or not is one, if you go by books and all that, you know, you need to look at the slippers of the patient. You need to see that, you know, the medial side will be much more, you know, uh, I should say used as compared to the lateral side. But a very simple manner is you ask the patient to stand with both of the feet. So you go at the back and try to look for the greater toe. In a normal individual, you will be able to see the great toe very nicely. But if he has pronated, then if you stand at the back, you see in this picture, you will not be able to see the great toe, right? And if it is overpronated, and that could be because of your mid-tarsals, uh, you know, laxicity, problem with your ligaments, right? All those things which you can go back and read. Uh, but for today's this thing, you do remember that here the pronation is very, very important. And all those, you know, if a patient who is having a high arch, that also needs to be taken care. Second thing, which is just commonly present, you know, for all the individuals, for all the entrapped neuropathies is diabetes. Fine. So these two things are, you know, there for all the, um, I should say, entrapment of the tibial nerve and it branches. Now, when you go and you just try to find out whether, you know, I have an entrapment of the tibial nerve in the proximal uh, tarsal tunnel, here ultrasound is really very, very, you know, important. And that's the reason of showing you that clip. So you have seen that we could see the tendons of tibialis posterior, your flexor digitorum longus, your flexor hollicis longus, then your veins. Fine. So now tenosynovitis of any of this tendon can be a factor, right? Because you have the tendons. Then there could be a ganglionic cyst. 
then there are veins so you can have the varicosity of the veins and you have this uh, you know tibia and then the talus will start so you have this joint also now you can have the osteophytes which will be just coming off to th of this joint and will be just poking there so you can if you really know what exactly are present there and if you put the probe i always say use ultrasound your as your stethoscope you know once you have just thought of something you put a probe and try to look for now you have seen that there are only three tendons you have seen now sometimes you can have an accessory fhl as well uh, accessory flexor digitorum longus as well so if you are seeing more than that then something should come to your mind that this is not normal i'm seeing something abnormal right then coming to uh, so that was about the tibial nerve inside the proximal tarsal tunnel now when you go to your medial it is very specific if i'm looking for a medial uh, plantar uh, you know nerve entrapment then the stiffness of this great toe i need to look for and here also the tenosynovitis of the tendon is very important but here what is important is when your fhl is crossing over your uh, you know uh, i should say the fdl because fhl is will be lying you know the lower most and your digitorum will be lying next to your tibialis posterior so fhl has to grow towards the great toe and this digitorum has to come towards the digit so there will be a crossing over which usually takes place somewhere here so if you have a tenosynovitis at this area yes you can have an entrapment of the medial plantar nerve so do scan your uh, you know uh, i should say uh, properly all your tendons when you are scanning up to their insertion keep on just identifying the things whether there is something which will be which can be a pain you know causative factor for the uh, you know the branches of the tibial nerve then you know somebody who has started running very uh, i should say uh, recently or who is walking for a long time wearing this you know shoes which are very tight tying the laces very tightly so all these things are again important causative factors for the entrapment of the medial nerve as well as for the lateral nerve this running and this shoes can be for the lateral not this one okay now when it comes to surgery usually when you have an achilles tendon uh, surgery they go for a you know tendon transfer it is the fhl which they use so if there is an fhl tendon transfer then there are you know chances of the medial plantar nerve entrapment more as compared to the lateral but they do have you know uh, lateral plantar nerve entrapment as well coming to your inferior calcaneal nerve or your baxter nerve the most important thing here is standing for a long time then if you have an heel spur yes if the patient has undergone any surgery for the plantar fascia yes you can have an scar tissue which will be just causing an entrapment of this nerve yes somebody has taken an steroid uh, injection there is an atrophy of the plantar fat pad yes that could be one of the cause and this paper was very good you know you can go through where you uh, have an hypertrophy of your abductor hallucis fine so these are the you know important causative factors when you are just thinking of the inferior calcaneal nerve entrapment now how exactly should be the presentation because we have learned so many things you know all the causative factors and all the nerves it is very very simple if you just uh, go back to the anatomy everything becomes very simple so if you have the entrapment of the tibial nerve obviously the entrapment the pa patients are going to have the burning pain paresthesia right but where exactly they are going to have this that is much more important to understand now if i am talking about a tibial nerve entrapment inside the proximal carpal tunnel obviously i can have a pain which will be radiating up or towards this foot or it may be going towards the heel but maximum problem i will be having towards this you know the medial uh, malleolus but if i'm thinking of a lateral plantar nerve entrapment obviously my pain is going to be towards the lateral side and that will be radiating towards this toes the lateral toe and if i'm expecting it to be a medial plantar nerve entrapment then the pain is going to be towards this you know the medial arch or the medial heel and this will be radiating towards the great toe and the Two, which is adjacent to it. So this is how you know where varied uh, presentation of pain will be helping you to understand what exactly you can think about. 
Second thing, always remember that these entrapment neuropathies, as I think Dr. Anand has also insisted that when uh, you talk about this, you know, what position you are trying to compress them. So here, what exactly will be the position which will be compressing this nerve? Obviously, when I'm going to walk or I'm, I'm going to do a weight-bearing activity, anything which is there. And of course, they'll be relieved by rest. And entrapment neuropathies, usually they'll have a night pain. So you will just get up from the bed and you they'll just wake you from your sleep. That's how they are. Now, coming to the inferior calcaneal nerve, this will be a little different, you know. This patients will be having, obviously, the pain, which will be over the medial side of the heel. Now, this patients will be giving you a history that, oh, I have been standing, you know, for a quite long time. Maybe the person who is doing this gatekeeper jobs, right? So they'll be standing four hours together. Now, you will, if you will closely watch their, uh, you know, feet, you will see that it is not a pronated one, but it is a supinated one. Pronated means the medial border will be used. Supinated means the lateral border will be used. So they will be using their lateral border so that this heel is not touching on the ground because as the moment it will touch the ground, they will be having this pain and which they cannot bear. So they will just try to overcome this by supinating their feet. It is very important. You always look at the feet when you are uh, really evaluating the entrapment neuropathies of the TBL nerve. Now, how we have learned that they pass it through the tunnels and if we are going to compress the tunnels, yes, of course, definitely you are going to have the, you know, uh, the symptoms which the patient is facing. So what you need to go for is the triple compression test, which is the dorsiflexion, eversion, and then you apply the pressure just beneath the, um, I should say, the medial malleolus. And this will be compressing not only your proximal you know, uh, tarsal tunnel, but at the same time, there'll be a compression of your medial and the plantar tarsal tunnel as well. And then you look for the reproduction of the symptoms. Then we talked about this, you know, the distal uh, tarsal tunnel, where you have the abductor holesis, which is really playing a very important role because everything is just passing beneath this muscle. So what you can do, how can you just tense it up? You can do a plantar flexion and inversion, and then you try to palpate this muscle. It's very easy. And if it is reproducing that symptoms, then think of, you know, all the branches which are just involved there. Then don't stop here because you need to rule out all the differentials. Try to palpate the central aponeurosis of the plantar fascia. Try to look for any kind of tenderness over the medial, you know, calcaneal tubercle. Then you squeeze your calcaneal just to rule out any kind of stress fracture. You palpate on either sides for the retro of the Achilles tendon to look for the retrocalcaneal bursas. Then you palpate the insertion of the Achilles tendon on the posterior aspect of the calcaneum. Now, at the same time, ask the patient to abduct the great toe and the little toe. Why? Because abductor holesis is by medial plantar. Abductor digiti minimi is by your inferior calcaneal nerve. So at least you will be having a rough idea. Then these are the differentials. Uh, I think tentinosinovitis I have already discussed. The one which I have not included was the S1 radiculopathy. That is also one of the differential diagnoses for this. Now, another branch is your interdigital nerve or we call, you know, as Morton's neuroma, though there is no tumor-like thing here, but still we call it as Morton's, Morton's neuroma. Now, what is... How this uh, patients will come to you, do remember that it has got uh, more, you know, the females are much more commonly involved as compared to males. She'll be a middle-aged female. She'll come to you saying that, oh, I'm having excruciating pain and, you know, uh, and it is just radiating towards my toe. And if you ask whether did you sustain any kind of trauma, she'll say, no, nothing. How do you feel? She'll say, I feel as if there is a thick socks. Or somebody, has, or I have just rolled up my socks or something hard is there, you know, at the ball of my foot. Even though I am not wearing anything like that, she will say. Now, she'll say that when I get up from the morning, I usually, and I put my feet there, it's very much painful. It's a burning, sharp, stabbing pain. Yes, of course, all these things will be getting aggravated by the activity. Night pain will also be there. And if you ask, did you, did you bother wearing new shoes? Or have you started, you know, uh, going for a walk in the morning? She'll say, yes, yes. Did you attend any function where you have worn high heels? Yes, of course, definitely. So these things are really a clue 
that you are dealing with and enter digital now. Now you see here why. The site for entrapment for this is your intermetatarsal ligaments, right? That is the one because they passes through this. So you can have an entrapment there or if you are wearing high heels and believe me, I've stopped wearing it after, you know, I came to know that it is so harmful. So in this condition, what usually will happen, you will be having a pressure here, right? And next to that, you are having your nerves. So it will be very much causing a pressure on the nerve. Then what you do, you just try to hold the interspace with one finger, index finger over the dorsum, one over the plantar and try to squeeze. Okay, that is Mulder sign. And you will be able to see something, you know, uh, some clicking sound there, right? So it, it, as if, you know, the nerve is just poking out, that is what it is. And you can go for a stretching of this interdigital nerve as well. Like just by simply doing a passive dorsiflexion of the toe. Now, why exactly all these things are happening here in this nerve? It's because it's just a degenerative neuropathy. Do remember that you have this perineural fibrotic mass associated with proliferation and the axonal degeneration. That is what they say is the pathogenesis for this Morton's neuroma. But yes, uh, there are some uh, papers they have come up with that is, it is also the ischemia or in fact the compression with the enlarged metatarsal bursa. Now, why only third nerve? It is because the third nerve is much more commonly involved as compared to the other one. It is because you have one branch from the medial plantar, one branch from the lateral plantar, and then these two will be combining and they will be supplying the third interdigital space. Okay. Now, the space is very narrow as compared to the other ones and you have a nerve which is bigger, right? And they say that there is a greater mobility. This is also very important between the third and the fourth metatarsal. So that is the reason the third is much more commonly involved as compared to the other one. Now, what are the differentials when you are talking about this is you can have a metatarsal stress fracture. So it is more, uh, you know, here also ultrasound will be very much helpful. Even before you have the appearance in the radiograph, uh, you know, you can very well see the periosteal reaction right? So these patients usually will be coming to you with metatarsalgia. And if you put your probe, nice periosteal reaction, you will be able to make out. Of course, if there are bursas, so you can have a bursitis. Now, plantar plate tear also you can make out very well. So this is something which will be covering the head of your uh, metacarpal and going up to the proximal phalanx, where you're usually in the hand, you have your pulley system. And here you have your tendons, which will be just crossing over it. Now, Freiburg's infarction is of course you have the collapse of the head of the uh, metacarpal this also you can very well find it out with your ultrasound and of course if you give some kind of injection it is not even getting relief think of proximal nerve pathology as well so this is just again a video where i'll be demonstrating you so now the patient is lying down in the supine position and uh, what i usually do is <clears throat> I put one of the finger over the dorsum. First, I try to look for this metacarpo, metatarsophalangeal joint, right? And then I slide down to the third interspace from this and you will be able to see the nerve very well. So let me clear the picture. So that is the nerve. So you put your probe in a craniochordal direction, right over the metatarsophalangeal joint, and then you slide it from the joint into the space. That will be the much easier way to identify. So you have your metatarsal head. I don't know. I'm not able to clear the picture. Okay, let me. Okay, now it will be fine. And let me play once again for you so that I can show you the plate, which injuries also you can make out very well. So that will be the head. That is your phalanx. These are your tendons. And this, what you are seeing here is your plantar plate. Okay, so you can very well make out the injuries. You can do, uh, I should say, the movement of your proximal phalanx and you can very well see the laxicity or any kind of tear there. So from there, you just slide your probe down and then you will be able to see the nerve well. Okay. Then... These are all about the entrapment neuropathies, their presentations, right? 
and how exactly you are supposed to verify them with ultrasound and though you have various other modalities also which we will be seeing now so first important thing is blood investigations yes like if a patient is having tenosynovitis like recently i have seen a patient of you know tibialis posterior and who was having an entrapment neuropathy of the tibial nerve so yes you need to find out whether he is having any kind of inflammatory arthropathy or not then do take the history of morning stiffness and whether the pair rest is increasing the pain or exercise is increasing the pain then of course diabetes do ask the patient whether there is any history of diabetes there in the family or not and yes plain radiograph is also very very important because we need to look for the foot foot alignment we need to exclude you know the fractures the joint joint degenerations and if you do not have an ss to ultrasound you can always go for an mri and as i always say ultrasound is the best you know for the peripheral nerve entrapment and treatment do not jump uh, you know just for interventions because i have been seeing people you know putting all the interventions as the first is it no first try to look for you know what exactly is the thing which is contributing this why he is having the nerve entrapment if it is a foot you know misalignment then you need to correct it right then obviously uh, you ask the patient to wear some orthotics if he is really having some foot alignment problem ask him to wear proper shoe when he is walking right go for stretching of the plantar flex uh, fascia exercises your achilles tendon strengthening your you know foot muscles and then of course this nsaids really helps these are uh, you know you can then go for various uh, ultrasound guided interventions and uh, people they use uh, you know various injected for everything you know i have just mentioned this is the tibial nerve that is your medial plantar that is your lateral plantar this is your medial plantar this is your inferior calcaneal and this is your interdigital right then you can use various injectives but my favorite nowadays is just 5% dextrose because i'm using it for my phd thesis also okay and it is really wonderful one thing which is very good about dextrose yes it's a normal constituent of our body we can use it in you know at least we can go a little more we can use up to 10 ml second thing it causes the most important thing is it causes the inhibition of your trpv1 receptors now this trpv1 receptors are the one which are responsible for your peripheral nociception right so basically you are if you are just uh, doing in hydro dissection with your dextrose you are basically um, i should say uh, have little bit of control over the sensitization which might be setting in right so because of this and now the recent uh, you know very good study has also come up where they have uh, you know insisted its role on the kinase activity as well so with that thank you so much uh, again dr bhavesh dr varshali and dr varsha for inviting me today and uh, i hope i have done justice to the topic Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. Very nice presentation. Let me go on to the question and answer. So, if anybody wants to ask the question, they can unmute themselves and can ask. Is there any questions in the chat box or the school? Yeah. Yeah. Hello. Yes. Yes. Yeah, go ahead, Doctor Sanjeev. Yeah, actually, I have one one question. Anybody can answer. This is regarding the hydro dissection of nerves with five percent dextrose only. Uh, if uh, so, my question is in and en nerve entrapment syndromes. Uh, what is the protocol for hydro dissection? Means you do only one session, or you repeat it after some one or two weeks. You do five to six sessions, uh, uh, mainly in the nerve entrapments related to the scar tissues. I'm asking. उट a uh, weak gap between the injection so thereby the dissection will be uh, 
um, complete or else like if you give more time you know the chances of refibrosis comes and then again it will be of no use so yes. three to six sittings ideally six at a gap of one week uh, would be ideal and uh, many literatures are supporting uh, this theory so we have to see sir uh, uh, if the patient is getting relief good so amount of actually, relief you know after... even if the patient is relieved also uh, we then can no. give it because yeah. it's an outpatient procedure it's an out i mean it's a clinic procedure so yes. like when we talk to them uh, we can counsel them for six injections it a week apart because that okay. will be complete or else like even if the patient gets good relief also they may come after a month with again pain yes yes so for the effective uh, defibrosing we need to have a week gap and ideally would be six so six sittings would be better okay. it's difficult because patient may not turn up if they are if they are better but uh, that there comes your pre procedural counseling where we need to explain them like the need for going for this uh, series of uh, hydro dissection rather than one or two they do yes. understand yes if we explain them the need and all those things then definitely they will yes yes, yes. thank you thanks yeah. okay any other questions uh, dr kanchan any other input or varied opinion no, actually the thing is when it comes to 5% dextrose now you don't have uh, recommendations it's like prp you know so uh, we need to what dr anand was telling we need to go with our systemic reviews and the meta analysis right so what he has been telling is there in the systemic reviews it's there in the meta analysis but if you really ask the recommendations there are no recommendations you know everybody is following like some people they do it after 2 weeks some people they do it after 10 days some people they do it after 7 uh, days supposedly a patient who is coming from a very far distance you will ask him to come after a week believe me he will not come okay, okay? <laughs> so at least uh, you tell him in the beginning itself that you know uh, it is mandatory you know if you will not do na your pain will keep on coming you explain him it in such a manner that it goes inside his head and that's where the counseling it's very important right before taking up the patient for procedure that's what dr anand was also telling yes it's very important but if we ask you is it necessary to take the six injections where it is written because nowadays patients have been you know becoming very much aware about the guidelines recommendations so yeah. tell them in the beginning you know that there are no recommendations for it but yes as far as the research literature which is concerned we can go up to this much but still you know minimum is 3 and maximum is 6 but you have to choose in between these two like that i explain it in this manner because many of my patients they come from a very far distance it's not possible for them to repeat it after 7 days so i give it uh, you know 10 days time to be very frank because most of the meta analysis uh, finally recommends for an rct because ideally there is no good rct is available no good rct very yeah, yes so very that's true. what they say like somewhere between 1 week to 2 weeks is what like generally it's actually it's not recommendation <laughs> it's based on the reviews so my question is the extension of sanjeev's question you can say kanchan and anand both of you uh, what about giving steroids in a later session say if you have done two three sessions of dextrose and at a later date is there any as you said there is no recommendation but any study or any literature that if patient can't come repeatedly not willing and then at a later stage not mix of course how about like is there any the dextrose has become you know very much i should say in the recent era otherwise if you'll go with the evidences they are all the with the steroid only yeah. you know they have got a good <laughs> level of evidence this neuro this neurogenic studies it came in may 2022 so you can imagine and the other one was something from 2017 if i'm not wrong and they were done by this uh, i think stanley lamb yes so these are all <laughs> recent researches now on the dextrose because if you compare you know you are going with the uh, i should say steroid you are injecting there there are lots of side effects now we are coming up so now people are becoming much more aware about the steroid so the moment you will tell them that i am going to inject steroid they'll say no they have developed that fear right so i think you know nowadays patients are much more aware about the steroid thing so they won't be uh you know adopting uh, they won't be going for it but still if you want yes steroid has got a better level of evidence but yes dextrose is something which is coming up now new and uh, it was there but now people are working more on it 
and yes uh, many good good researches are also coming up and it is cheap also right so that can also reduce the cost of your procedure as well yeah so i have, do yeah yeah i do agree with uh, what dr kanchan is saying actually the the the, the recent scenario is slightly different uh, maybe i would say for last 3 to 5 years like you know um, we are actually moving away from uh, usage of the steroids either we go for hydro dissection or a pulsed radio even the pulsed uh, radio frequency forum uh, in peripheral nerves is a big entity now coming up so a lot of people are now moving away from the uh, steroids but there is no contraindication but all my studies whatever i have put also was a very recent one it's 2022 2023 so it's all the recent ones like more favoring the Uh, hydro dissection and the pulsed uh, radio frequency that is the neuromodulation for the peripheral nerves over the steroid and um, the the moment we say steroid the patient states are you going to inject steroid for me like you know it's it's becoming like that the the more the the more the awareness comes the more the problem also uh, we face from the patient end so but we can justify using steroid as well uh, because that's gold standard we can use but now with this hydro dissections like we mm-hmm. always tell you know like we are uh, dealing with the mechanical process like we dissect and then we yeah, take the mechanism uh, of action i was yes, trying yeah, to yeah, point yeah, out yeah. hydro dissection anti inflammatory and then rf yes so like uh, yeah in particular cases if we can prefer something over the other absolutely like like dealing with the etiology we would rather That's, say yeah Okay. I think the peripheral neuromodulation, when it comes to uh, you know your tibial nerve and all those things, it is still long way to go. Long way to go. You you do not see any literature of your PRF uh, for this, right? And even the cryo, I uh, what I have read is only for your sural and your saphenous, and of course for the uh, like you know the inferior calcaneal nerve, right? Uh, so you have to just uh, say to the patient that if you want to compromise on your abductor digiti minimi and the proprioception yes please go ahead otherwise for this tibial and the medial plantar because they have their mixed nerves right you have a sensory and the motor so it is like a long way to go i think we might be uh, you know dealing we might be treating this patients with whatever i have listed and of course your my favorite 5% dextrose Yes, other areas you have lo- like so many, uh, you know. No, Pudental has got a lot of uh, positive yes. Uh, yes. results yeah, with the yeah. pulse yes. torf TZ because in the But, the pain physician journals, lot of uh, pulse torf TZ uh, papers are coming, case series, case studies. Mm-hmm. Of course, there is no uh, RCTs, but uh, with regards to Pudental, now there are lot of literature yes. supporting uh, PR, PRN, PRF. if we keep the uh, cost issue aside what about the perineural P- uh, prp injections compared to the 5% dextrose injections see the prp is botox they are all there in the armamentarium we can actually use but if you see there is no recommendation as such but like this is based on how comfortable we are and again you know like the hydro dissection like is more of a uh, uh, the treating the Uh, pathology you know um, and so that's why like there are people are using botox people are using uh, um, platelet yeah. plasma injection and there are literature supporting it uh, um, so again like you know there is nothing called one single modality which is actually you know uh, the best or that having level 1 yeah actually there is no level of there is no mm-hmm. recommendation and there is no level of in, uh, evidence as of now so we all go with whatever comfortable we are and then uh, we go with our patient reviews but of course yes we can use prps we can use botox like uh, uh, the 5% dextrose and uh, uh, your steroids okay <laughs> any inputs from the Sanjo, any anything well, left in your arm moment i'm done <laughs> thank you <laughs> for the time being <laughs> Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah, so yes, Archana. Yes, please. Uh, just one question. Uh, do the patients get immediate relief with five percent extrus, a hydro dissection? Yeah. Okay. okay sir. Thank you. Yeah, they do. Okay, sir. <laughs> okay. 
Okay, I think all the speakers have done justice to their topics, and uh, now I request Dr. Varsha to take over. Thank you. Shannon, you are sharing something? Yeah, I want to share this. I want to invite all of you for the MSK Congress, which uh, I'm conducting in Chennai. So it's a warm welcome to all of you. Uh, uh, so it's an it's an open invitation. Like I wish uh, all of you to come and then support this Congress. And it's the second one. And uh, we have observers coming from World Institute of Pain, Professor Miles coming. So like uh, we just want to bring the MSK uh, forum and then make a, a good meeting and then uh, uh, the agenda is very simple, like bringing everyone together under one forum and then uh, uh, have a standardization in uh, uh, MSK and ultrasound. So it's an open invitation for all of you. Please do come. I will send you the invitation. Yeah, Dr. Anand, we would love to come. But the organizing committee of ISSP <laughs> Con 2024 won't allow us to come. <laughs> so even if we wish to, it's too close to us. Even if we wish to, yeah. So had it been little a month earlier, definitely. Oh, was... we are actually planning to reschedule the event from next year. So yeah. we'll be in touch with the ISSP uh, leadership on this particular thing. Uh, due to yeah. several reasons, logistics reasons, we placed it this way. But we are seriously considering to reschedule the dates from next year. Yeah, that would be welcome. Yeah, absolutely, that would be wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we are actually serious. Very welcome move. Yeah, yeah, because like uh, it's the recommendation comes from the WAP as well. So we are actually going to reschedule. It's not going to clash with ISSP in any way. So which we'll be announcing in this Congress as well. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Anand. Thank you. And now I would like to thank and uh, close the session by thanking all the speakers, Dr. Kanchan, Dr. Anand, and Dr. Archana. And Archana, special thanks for jumping in last minute yesterday, right from the moment we came to know that Nivedita is not keeping well. Thanks to Priya, Archana, who jumped in and were here to complete the session. So thank you. Archana. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Varshali, ma'am. Thanks, Dr. Varsha. Thanks, Dr. Bhavesh. I'll meet you soon in it's, some it's other... It's my uh, time, Dr. Anand. Wait. <laughs> we'll meet you soon on so, an, another webinar. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. We would like to have another topic with you yeah. guys. And uh, wonderful recording, both of you, Dr. Anand. I make, I, my apologies. I exceeded the time. Next time, I'll make sure I'll be within my stipulated time. No, no, sure, no. Not sure. <laughs> Okay. Now it was interesting and very nice recording, both of you. Yes. Realized, it's uh, always a pleasure to see USG, you know, it's so close to the heart. Absolutely, ma'am. I do agree. Yeah. And thanks to Dr. Bhavesh for moderating the session effectively within oh, time. My line, pleasure. <laughs> spite of his reminders. Yes. Uh, we could proceed within timeline, actually, not crossing much of a timeline, which was not expected. Dr. Uh, uh, sorry, Mr. Rahul Chobe, Anesthesia TV, for giving us uninterrupted support throughout in every webinar. So, the last three years, every monthly webinar, taking this meeting at a time on five platforms globally. So, he's a wonderful man behind the screens. You can come on screen, Mr. Rahul. We will be happy to see you. Thank you for this support. I would like to thank all SSPP team, our family who works in the background, though in the screen it's only me and Dr. Varshali and moderator is visible, but it's the whole teamwork yes. which goes on in the background for the whole month, deciding the topics, suggesting speakers and all. And they are also on different platforms, though not here directly on Zoom. So thanks to our team. Society for Study of Pain, Pune. And most importantly, our audience, our viewers. This goes on live and almost 800 to 1000 viewership we get every webinar. So <clears throat> without them, no webinar could be successful and interactive. So thanks everyone. Okay. Yes, Dr. Anand. Thank you, Varsha. So much. And thank you, Dr. Anand and Dr. Kanchan. And of course, our own Dr. Archana. 
thank you thank you all thank you so much everyone man. from the bottom of our from the bottom of my heart and it was great being with all of you and learning you know it's always a continuous process so thank you so much okay bye bye good thank night thank you bhavish for a wonderful conduction happy thank navratri you, and happy dashera to everyone thank you thank you all bye yes, we will call you bye bye night